Warning, the following video contains adult language and content that may not be suitable for younger viewers. Even though this warning is probably just going to make them want to watch it more. You have been warned. Go away! Come on, man. Are you going to talk about the history of rock and roll of the 2000s? No! I got goldfish. <sighs> what is there to talk about? I already mentioned that the 90s was the last great decade for rock and roll. Okay, listen, listen, listen. I'm not a fan of the 2000s either. Okay? Okay. Okay. But, I'm sure there are some good bands out there, such as, uh... Simple plan. Sorry, I can't be perfect. The 2000s were weak. Uh, hey, what, what? The strength of the genre is failing. The blood of R&B is all but spent. It is because of the 2000s that rock and roll no longer exists. I was there, other guy. Good evening. I was there almost 20 years ago. When the strength of rock and roll failed. Hey, listen, if we're gonna do a Lord of the Rings parody, uh, can I change my shoes? I know there's a lot of walking in those movies. Listen to me! You don't know half of the things that I've seen. To gaze into my repressed memories of the 2000s is to gaze into the mind of a madman. Leave here now with your memory of the 20th century and don't look back! Uh, but, but I, I said uh, don't look back! Did you try offering him the goldfish? I did. He still refuses to talk about it. I don't know what else to do. Look, I think there's a way that we can convince him. We just need to approach it in a mature, tactful manner. Mm hmm Will you talk about the 2000s? No. 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 I talk about the 2000s, do the two of you promise to leave my apartment and never come back? <laughs> you know we can't do that, man. <laughs> you are such a cutie! <laughs> never come back. I'm J.T. Curtis. This is History of Rock and Roll, the 2000s. In music today, you very rarely hear guitar solos, and everything just sounds the same. You know, I, I'll listen to one song on the radio, next minute I hear a completely different song, a completely different band, it sounds exactly the same. You see that? That's me from 2006, already disillusioned by a creatively bankrupt music industry. Honestly, this is why it's hard for me to talk about artists from the 2000s, because technically I was a 2000s artist. Hello everybody, happy new year! I mean, I didn't get on the Billboard charts or anything, but I did tour with my band Seventh Son, got some local airplay, TV placement, and did eventually release an album in 2008 called From the Beginning, which is still available online. I even had a few meetings with famed record executive Amit Erdogan in consideration for Atlantic Records, true story. Unfortunately, my meeting with Amit wasn't too encouraging, and the conversation went something like this. The music business is over. We're not developing artists anymore. If you don't already have five million fans, we're not interested. Of course, if I had five million fans, I wouldn't need a record company. And that kind of became the ongoing debate early on. At the turn of the millennium with the rise of file sharing programs like Napster, the record companies were running scared. Napster is enabling millions of people to get free music 
with just a few keystrokes at their computers. They were definitely naive for not accepting digital files as a future musical frontier. The record companies say they will lose billions in sales because fans are getting their music for free. And I'm not gonna be a hypocrite and pretend I didn't spend a lot of time on LimeWire. It's practically how I discovered some of the music I've been talking about all this time. But the record companies and wealthy bands like Metallica fought over their music being available over the internet for free. I was not asked if Napster could throw our music into their system. Funny how times have changed. And of course, there was the hypocrisy that these greedy companies and bands were crying over lost money. Recording artists will be forever doomed to a life of only semi-luxury. Well, as an independent artist, I can tell you that this did create some issues for us, but not in the way that the record companies would have you believe. When I was still in high school, my band cut an EP, made up some CDs, and would sell them. But I do remember a lot of my friends saying, can't you just download it for me? And that's really where my issue with the Millennium starts. As convenient as iTunes and digital music was, it kind of devalued it. When you went to a record store and picked up a new CD, it was like an event. You couldn't wait to get it home, listen to it in your car, check out the liner notes, invite your friends over for a listening party. Now, being able to buy any song with the push of a button kind of took the excitement out of it. And sometimes I'd find myself buying something on iTunes and never even listening to it. So because of this unprecedented change, Change, record companies cut back on their A&R departments and took up the position of only putting out records that were guaranteed to sell. Hence why artists like Britney Spears were given all their attention and indie artists had to struggle to get their songs played. And that's not to say that the change didn't give us a lot more opportunities. Hell, the fact that I've released music independently, even have this show, is a testament to what a powerful tool the internet has been for us. A band from Sheffield who first built a following on the internet are set to have the fastest selling debut album since chart records began. But the paradox is that it forced the landscape of popular music to become much more superficial, even more so than the 80s. And one of the genres to suffer most from this change? Rock and roll. Already the genre was being squeezed. I mentioned Woodstock 99 in the last episode, but in June of 2000, a Pearl Jam concert in Amsterdam ended tragically with nine people being trampled to death. And tens of 15 people have been badly hurt. The mosh pit era would become a thing of the past. I used to see signs like this all the time when I played gigs in the early 2000s. In many ways, I feel I really owe Amit much gratitude for telling it to me straight. Maybe Napster forcing us to go the indie route was a blessing in disguise. So I guess I'm in a unique position having seen this change in the music industry from the inside out, but needless to say, I was so focused on my own band, I just didn't really care about mainstream rock at this time, and I don't know that I can approach it from an objective point of view. But hey, you want to hear me talk about the 2000s? Let's see if we can find some cool stuff. It was the year 2000, a brand new millennium. The world did not end like it was predicted. So let's see what music was popular at the time. Maybe it wasn't as bad as I remember. Baby, bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. I'm JT Curtis. This is the history of rock and roll. No, 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 no. You sit down. Come on. There were other songs released during that year. In fact, Three Doors Down released their first single just 11 days into the year 2000. That was a pretty big hit. Oh yeah, I remember this song. It's still got that darker alternative rock sound, like something off of a Candlebox record. It's not quite breaking new ground, but Three Doors Down was a good band and would continue having some success throughout the decade. In fact, quite a few rock songs, even the poppier ones, were still retaining that post-grunge sound. Please welcome Lifehouse. <laughs> Though it was starting to feel a bit tired and further removed from its darker roots. And if it's something dark you want, Outkast released their song Bombs Over Baghdad just two years before the Iraq War. Outkast? They're not rock and roll. Well, more dance hall R&B. But this tune actually has a pretty cool guitar solo in it. Here. If we need a more objective source to cite, I have with me Rolling Stone's best albums of the 2000s and 
guess which one is number one? I know, it's Kid A by Radiohead. I've yeah. seen this list before. Yeah, in fact, it's not just this list, it's often listed by other sources as one of the best albums of the 2000s. Yes, you mean other highly paid hipster journalists who seem to hold the key to the door of rock and roll history. Long have I sought their inevitable demise. Hey, buddy, can we just stick to the songs, please? Don't I gotta say, I've listened to this album many times over the years, and up until I was going to do this video, I just didn't get it. It's definitely an acquired taste. Following the tour for OK Computer, Tom York just got burnt out, tired of the conventional rock sound, and wanted to pretty much hit reset on Radiohead's career. Fucking rock music sucks, man. I hate it. I just I totally snapped. Had enough of it. Keep in mind, a follow-up to OK Computer was heavily anticipated, and when this ambient electronic CD was released, People didn't know what to think of it. Even the title track sounds more like a computer experiment, manipulating sounds and Pro Tools, including York's voice, to sound like what I can only describe as a robot voice. I was ready to tear this album apart going into this episode, but I have to admit, on my last listen through, something happened. I turned the lights down, let the ambience take over, and started to feel that sense of alienation York was going for. Honestly, it did make me feel legitimately anxious. And once How to Disappear completely came in, it was like this huge sense of relief. This is that was like a, a mantra to get out. Something like Tools Lateralis, which my followers will crucify me over if I don't talk about, was also very experimental. There's definitely some abnormal time signatures and arrangements, but the organic instrumentation and flowing lyrics just made it feel more grounded. Not to mention the fact that, well, it just rocks hard. Another album lauded as the best of the 2000s is Wilco's Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. Now this was an album that was not well received initially. In fact, Wilco's record company flat out refused to release it. But their lack of vision would soon be their downfall, for their reign of terror would soon... So the band just streamed it live on their website. Oh wow, that's actually pretty ahead of their time. Much like Kid A, this one's a bit too esoteric for me, but Heavy Metal Drummer is one of the most accessible tunes. Is it weird I want to hear Wilco do a Kiss cover? Here's something more accessible. Is This It by The Strokes. This makes a little more sense. I remember enjoying this album, even if Last Night sounds an awful lot like Tom Petty's American Girl. In fact, I still have the CD. Check it out. Huh. What's up with the cover? Oh yeah, well, well we didn't get the original album cover in the US, which might as well have been the cover to Spinal Tap's album. How much more black could this be? And the answer is... None. The Strokes came out of the New York indie rock scene, and Is This It featured a more bare-bones raw production sound. Not a lot of reverb, distorted vocals, and it definitely pioneered a new kind of sound, very different from the grunge era. What else do they list as the best? Uh, Arcade Fire's funeral album. Really? Yeah. I mean, I like these albums, but is this really the best the decade has to offer? Well, according to Rolling Stone here. Uh, what do they say about it? Well, they say... Loss. Love. Forced coming of age. And fragile generational hope. Arcade Fire's debut touched on all of these themes as it defined the... Hey, you know what? Forget what the critics say. Let's listen to something that perfectly embodies the early 2000s. Linkin Park's Hybrid Theory. Hey, now we're talking. Yeah. Oh, I even got an uh, old iPod from the early 2000s. The display doesn't work anymore, but, you know, it's the thought that counts. I don't know. I remember those original MP3 sounding really crappy. Lots of digital noise. Eh, I'm sure it'll be all right. Here, let's listen. Ah! See? It's perfectly fine! Crawling in my skin! Turn it off! These wounds, they will oh. not live! Oh, hey! Hi! What for? I can play this from 
from my phone, literally. I mean, I can actually just connect it to the TV. Watch. I'm not gonna lie, I kinda enjoyed this album. Maybe the moody slash your wrists theme got a bit tiring, but musically, it was a pretty unique blend of Mike Shinoda's hip hop verses with the late Chester Bennington's screaming choruses. What it meant to me will eventually be a memory of a time when I tried so hard and got so far. But in the end, it doesn't even matter. <sighs> he said, in the end. <laughs> If you can't beat him, join him. This album was huge, one of the biggest selling albums of the 21st century. Almost the nevermind of its time. And there certainly was no shortage of new metal acts at this time. We talked about Korn in the last episode. Bands like Static X and the Deftones were also very influential. In 2000, you also had Godsmack. I'm alive for you, I'm away. Disturbed. Alive. You know, I think I've honestly grown out of these new metal acts. I never really liked them. Yeah, but you don't like anything. This is true. Yeah. Although it was pretty funny to watch these videos on VH1, where every other word was filtered out. Don't give up. Want to know what my favorite album in 2000 was? Eric Clapton and B.B. King's Riding with the King record. Don't you know you're riding with the King? Uh, how old was B.B. at this point? Uh, 75. I mean, couldn't you be into anything a little bit more current? Like, didn't you like Coldplay? Coldplay! Yeah, they were all yellow. I came along. I wrote a song. Yes, I remember them. I remember the scars my ears suffered, my damaged pride from wanting to be a heavy rocker, and constantly being told by producers and record execs, why didn't you sing more like Chris Merton? I saw her there, eating veggie pizza, and her name was Lisa. She was so yellow. Well, maybe I don't want to sing like Chris Martin, you ambitionless, stupid record company types with your sales charts and your focus groups. It's okay. I it's okay. They can't get to you anymore. They can't get to you. What do you take it from here? Do something? Oh, yeah. um, uh, so... Nowadays, Coldplay, originally from London, is looked upon as one of the most influential bands of the 2000s. But back when they first came out, they weren't loved by everyone. You know how I know you're gay? Yeah. You like Coldplay. Wow. That joke certainly aged well. In all fairness, Coldplay isn't really all that bad. I mean, they were competent writers, still are, obviously. And they could create sort of an interesting meditative kind of vibe. I just always sort of felt like they sounded like U2 on Valium. <laughs> I was into in the early 2000s? No. no. Well, too bad, because I'm going to tell you. The Gorillaz. I'm useless, but not for long. The future is coming on. Born of the creation of Blur frontman Damon Auburn and comic book artist Jamie Hewlett, best known for Tank Girl, the Gorillaz is one of the most successful not real bands on the planet. They hit it big in 2001 with their self-titled debut album, which included songs like Clint Eastwood. Things only got better with their 2005 release, Demon Days, which featured Feel Good Inc. <laughs> With a mixed up genre of funky electronica, hip hop, and punk, Gorillaz is another band whose sound is so unique and unlike the mainstream, it's no wonder they've stuck around even after the decade ended. What about you? What were you into in the turn of the millennium? I mean, I was really into Britney. L listen, I gave you one Britney song in the last video. I'm not playing another. What do you want me to say? I was a 12 year old girl. That's no excuse. How about Pink's Misunderstood album? I'll settle for that. Yeah, because it's a good one. I mean, Get This Party Started is kind of rockin'. You gotta love the spiky hair. It's very punk. I actually sang this song for my eighth grade talent show. 
I sang Ghostbusters for my eighth grade talent show. I was also into Michelle Branch. Cause you're She did that song with Santana, right? She did, yeah. Oh, nice. So please tell me why. But you know, the early 2000s was also a time of great suffering and hardship. I remember tuning into my TV and witnessing sheer horror that I had never witnessed before. Oh, God. Yeah, in seriousness, I watched this show more to see them making fun of the bad singers. Thank you. And that and there lies the problem. With reality TV now plaguing the nation, American Idol seemed more interested in exploiting amateur singers than actually showcasing unique talents. Well, a lot of rock artists actually emerged from the show. I mean, Daughtry came from Idol. Hell, Adam Lambert fronted Queen. And even their first winner, Kelly Clarkson, she had a couple of rock-influenced tunes. Even if she did have to fight the higher-ups to take control of her career. Actually, I was on an Idol-type show called America's Most Talented Kid on NBC when I was 14. I bet I have the tape somewhere. I'm gonna go look at my apartment for it, okay? Uh, okay. All right. I hate to bring the mood down. I, I know this is an unpleasant subject, but we got to get out of the way. I am talking, of course, about Nickelback Silver Side Up, released on September 11th, 2001. Wait, what? Yeah, I'm not joking. That album was actually released the same day as the World Trade Center attacks. Jesus Christ, that's a bad omen. No wonder people hate this band so much. In all seriousness, Canadian band Nickelback was practically a running joke on the internet. Bad music makes people violent. Like, Nickelback makes me want to kill Nickelback. <laughs> hey, I uh, couldn't find the tape. What are we listening to? Well, Nickelback just released... I'm gonna come back later. You know, to be honest, I've never really understood why they have this much hate. Ugh, don't tell me you like them. Oh no, I'm not that much of a contrarian. Yeah, you are, but y you know, continue. I mean, I definitely listen to them over Creed, not that that's saying much. Look at this photograph! If they had come out in the early 90s, I think they would have just been seen as another generic alternative rock band. That may be true, but they played their dull, mediocre songs on the radio all the time. It just got so tiring, it's like, play something else, man! Remember what that annoying hippie bum said? You get tired of anything that was played 80 billion times. I'm sorry, I'm still trying to get over the fact that a Nickelback album was released on 9-11. Okay, let's get this out of the way. On September 11th, 2001, a terrorist attack destroyed the World Trade Center. It was one of the darkest days in U.S. history and was to millennials what the Kennedy assassination must have been to the boomer generation. And with the anthrax scare, looming wars in the Middle East, it really set this post-apocalyptic tone for a good part of the decade. One fascinating memory I have is seeing a telethon called America, a tribute to heroes, which really showed me the healing power of music. I remember you two, who were experiencing a resurgence, performing the song Walk On. A very uplifting number, and maybe their best since the 80s. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers did Won't Back Down. Bon Jovi did an acoustic version of Living on a Prayer, which I actually consider the best version of this song. It was also the first time I ever saw Alicia Keys, who did an emotional cover of Donny Hathaway's Someday We'll All Be Free, one of my favorite songs of all time. But the most moving performance was a brand new song from Bruce Springsteen. Come on, with me, come on, come on, rise up, come on, rise up. 
This would actually be a preview of his 2002 album, The Rising. I think it's one of the best I ever made and uh... Oh. I have a personal connection with this record. It got me and my family through a lot of really hard times in the early 2000s. Getting up in the morning and hearing get through this lonesome day was a form of medicine in and of itself. And he wasn't the only one. Paul McCartney wrote the Freedom Song. By the way, I should also mention that only two months after 9-11, George Harrison died of cancer. Everything passes except the essence of that which is our soul. A year later, his last record, Brainwashed, would be his swan song and a reflection on life and death. I did a full review of this album if you want to check it out. Okay, let's get back on track. I remember something of a rock explosion around 2002-2003. Yeah, that's true. It wasn't quite the bang we had in the 90s, but this may very well be the last time rock and roll enjoyed some regular airplay. Like Queens of the Stone Age's Songs for the Deaf album featuring Dave Grohl on drums. Or The Darkness, who captured more of that classic glam rock vibe. And on the alternative metal scene, you had bands like Stained and Three Days Grace. I hate everything about you. For the most part, hip hop was really the music of the time, thanks in part to Eminem's hit film 8 Mile. I'm still standing here screaming, fuck the free world! OG artists like the late great DMX. X go give it to you. And also. I want to piss on you. <laughs> right. But on the rock scene, you had Australian band The Vine. Who were like the 500th band to destroy their equipment on live TV? 507th, actually. Yeah, whatever. Is he all right, Paul? In fact, I remember all the bands listed on this Rolling Stone cover. We talked about The Strokes already, who were still doing well. I said, please don't go The Hives, from Sweden, I remember them. It's kind of like the 60s British Invasion, except it's the 2000s, and Swedish. Yeah, like I said, there was a much more stripped-down approach with this garage rock revival. In the White Stripes case, it was just a duo, drums and guitarist Jack White, who might as well have been the whole band. Unfortunately, I've personally dealt with the White Stripes on copyright stuff, and I'm not about to go down the road just to play one of their songs. Aw, oh, man, I was looking forward to making fun of their husband and wife turned brother sister routine. Yeah, that's all right. We can talk about the Black Keys. Oh, okay. I remember one of my music friends playing me their first album, showing off their cover of the Beatles' She Said, She Said. <laughs> And this was very raw, recorded on an 8-track, released through an indie label. Indie rock was definitely rising from the underground. What does that even mean? I, I mean, okay, I get uh, signing with an independent label, but what makes indie rock so much different from, you know, all the other subgenres? It doesn't make it that different, it's, it's just kind of a sound, really. Let's look at Turn On The Bright Lights by Interpol, also from New York. Outside of the strokes, this is a really good archetype for indie rock. Low-key record label, underground following. Those driving eighth notes on the guitar, distorted vocals and drums. It really carries all the textures of indie rock. And it's definitely got its influence in the early 80s New Wave era, just like 90s took from late 60s, early 70s British rock bands. Later on in 2004, Scottish band Franz Ferdinand got some heavy airplay. And even semi-established bands like Modest Mouse, who were signed with Epic Records, they kind of got lobbed in the indie rock scenes as well. Already we're all on, all right. How can 
they be an indie rock band if they're signed to a major label? I don't know. Forced legitimacy? Uh, you want to talk about the Killers? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're probably the most successful example of these new wave throwback acts, originally from Las Vegas. Yeah. This record is a real killer. Actually, that joke's not too bad. Let's move on. Oh, hey! The Killers! Now we're talking! Let's face it, you've heard Mr. Brightside a million times. but most of the songs on the Hot Fuzz album are pretty solid as well. Smile Like You Mean It, All These Things I've Done, Somebody Told Me. The Killers have really been compared to the Cars, though they're certainly not alone in being compared to retro bands. Remember Jet? They were a thing for a minute. One, two, three, hand my hand to come with me because you look so fine that I really want to make you mine. I remember thinking this album was cool because it sounded like an old school rock and roll record, sort of a cross between The Stones, ACDC, and Iggy Pop. But that's kind of my issue with these 2000s indie rockers. I like some songs, but I was more interested in the bands they originally listened to. Needless to say, the bigger record labels started sweeping into this indie rock scene. Even Metallica's St. Anger album tried to tap into that garage rock sound, and it just didn't work. Saint I do like this stuff better than what was happening on mainstream radio, like Maroon 5, which really sounded more like a pop band. Hey! You want something that was rocking the charts? Avril Lavigne. Oh man, that's taking me back. I used to love Avril Lavigne. I used to straighten my hair beyond straight just to look like her. <laughs> Actually, I kind of did that today. She had just such a different style from all the other teeny bopper pop queens. She was a little rough around the edges. He was a skater boy. She said, see you later, boy. He wasn't good enough for her. She had a pretty face, but her head was up in space. She needed a comeback. I loved Skater Boy, I loved Complicated. Tell me you know, speaking of Avril Lavigne, I guess now's as good a time as any to talk about emo music. Well, Avril Lavigne is pop punk, not emo. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, emo would be Jimmy Eat World. I mean, the title of their album was Bleed American, which was changed following the September 11th attacks. But the song they're best known for, The Middle, has a more positive message. It just takes some time, little girl, in the middle, out the right. Don't write yourself off yet, just be yourself. You can see why so many kids clung to it in these dark times. I mean, I like the song, but I'm not really getting an emo vibe from it. Yeah, it feels more like a Blink-182 kind of thing. Hello there. From my nightmare. What the what the hell happened to Blink-182 and why are they wearing clothes? <laughs> Sellouts. Back in the day, I had no idea what emo was and I really didn't care. I knew emo was short for emotional and incorporated more melancholic lyrics, but not through the influence of gothic bands like The Smiths or The Cure. Emo's roots are more in hardcore bands. So then wouldn't Nirvana technically be emo? Or Offspring? Hell, I've seen Weezer's Green album listed as a contemporary emo album. And it makes me feel so fine, I can't control my brain. Yeah, I don't get it. By the way, as of this recording, a lot of this music is experiencing something of a resurgence on TikTok. Or at least videos of people lip syncing to it. Mom, there was never a face. It's a lifestyle. I got you Right, a lifestyle. To be fair, even I jumped on this bandwagon. Mom, it was never a phase, because I was never into this crap to begin with. Well, probably one of the most famous bands to come out of the emo phase was Fall Out Boy. Fall Out Boy! Oh, jeez, oh with this God. crap again. In all seriousness, I really did have a hard time listening to Fall Out Boy's albums, particularly their first album, Take This to Your Grave, fitting title. Where 
these songs are so bubblegum poppy, they might as well have been written for Hilary Duff. And even more disheartening, this sounds like music you were supposed to like in high school because it was cool or trendy. Though to their credit, their follow-up from Under the Cork Tree was a better effort. Dance Dance and Sugar We're Going Down are good tunes. Okay, you know, I don't get why this is considered emo. Well, it's probably because of the lyrics and Patrick Stump's vocals are less rebellious and more about high school breakups. If the video looks like something out of a late 2000s high school teenage romance movie, it's probably emo. Okay, what about Good Charlotte? Are they an emo band? No, they're pop punk. Girls don't like boys, girls like cards and money. What about the All American Rejects? Are they pop punk? No, they're emo. They all sound the same! That's what I've been trying to tell you! It's just another label that the- Oh, I got I, it! The perfect archetype for emo rock. My Chemical Romance. I'm not working. Ah. Mm, there's the guy liner in all its glory. Mm -hmm. Lead singer Gerard Way, another New Jersey native, formed My Chemical Romance shortly after 9-11, finding music to be a way to channel his emotions, which he certainly wasn't shy about conveying. Yeah. You know, is it just me? Or is the lead singer channeling his inner Jack Black from School of Rock? And the letter of the rich was way hardcore! Side note, Tenacious D and the Pick of Destiny is frickin' hilarious, and Dave Grohl plays the best movie devil of all time. Speaking of the devil, if you want something really emotional, both lyrically and musically, I have just the thing. Evanescence's Fallen album. Evanescence was fronted by Amy Lee, whose voice is so emotive and haunting, though the record company basically forced them to add a rap in Bring Me to Life, which she initially didn't want. They weren't going to put her album out or do anything unless we full-time hired some dude to be in the band. And at the end of the fight, after a couple weeks of starving him out, they called back and they were like, all right, you just have to put it in one song. It's got to be the first single. Fortunately, the rest of the tracks on Fallen focus on her operatic voice. Going Under, Taking Over Me, My Immortal. When you Oh, Amy Lee, you're such a tortured soul. You'll always be my immortal. And they've continued to put out a lot more amazing music, like Call Me When You're Sober, complete with gothic gloves that give her the power of flight. I don't know, I mean, it's good music, but I've just heard it so many times, I just don't care. Can I have my spot back, please? I was more into Nightwish. So were you a Nightwish fan at all, or...? Has anyone ever mentioned how hard it is to use your phone with gloves on? I can't use my phone with these gloves on! No, no, no I, I, I don't think say, anybody no, ever no. did this say that. No, nope. no. So as I mentioned, the internet was opening a whole new landscape for bands and artists to connect with fans. And by far, the biggest one at the time was, of course, MySpace. Oh, MySpace! You know, at one point I had like almost 100,000 followers on MySpace. Yes, a lot of people had lots of followers. How sad that the current music scene was judged not on the quality of musicianship or the quality of writing. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, a lot of bands used MySpace when they were just starting out. There was Devil Wears Prada, Bring Me the Horizon, and a little known high school band called Panic at the Disco. Some of you might have heard of them. I didn't even know they existed at the time. That's because you suck. I chime in with the haven't you people ever heard of Closing a goddamn door, no In fact, they sent a demo to Fall Out Boy bassist Pete Wentz through Live Journal, who signed the band to their own indie label. Oh, I remember Live Journal. It was a lot like Tumblr, except not a total dumpster fire. 
Also, YouTube had launched by this time, and Sins Not Tragedies became one of the first viral music videos from an established band, with its circus wedding theme. I like Panic at the Disco more than I do some of these other bands. Yes, you can definitely hear that Fall Out Boy influence, especially in singer Brendan Urie's voice, but you also hear a lot of Queen and Brian Wilson influence. That's probably why their debut album, A Fever You Can't Sweat Out, feels like it took more chances and wasn't just a high school trendy thing. I especially appreciate the digs of the music industry. In fact, I think their second album, Pretty Odd, went even more experimental, and would be their last album with chief songwriter and guitarist Ryan Ross before the band would just become Yuri. But again, I kinda just get burnt out with them after a while. The thing I'm really noticing about these songs in regards to their similarities is that they all kind of have that same early Pro Tools style production to it. That's not to say there wasn't a production formula in earlier decades, but recording to tape just made the tracks sound more alive. Pro Tools still being a semi-young program just made these songs feel kinda stale. The drums are too compressed, the vocal sound is a bit harsh, and everything feels separated, more like an assembly than a performance. If you go at it trying to make sure that all the production is there, and that the sound is there, and the performance is perfect, well then it becomes a pain in the ass. And this goes back to that 2000s model of manufacturing records guaranteed to sell. I completely understand that younger millennials and Gen Zers have nostalgia for these songs. I have nostalgia for adolescent songs from the 90s, and I certainly wouldn't hide the fact that even the earliest rock and roll records weren't being marketed to kids, they were. But as I've been saying, what makes these records so endearing, from Little Richard to Jimi Hendrix to Nirvana, is both authenticity and that rebellious fuck you attitude. When you're growing out of listening to Disney sing-along songs, this music is a real eye-opener, or in this case a real ear-opener. But in the mid-2000s, these were the Disney sing-along songs. Yeah, you know how everyone complains about Disney ruining Star Wars? That was the 2000s in rock and roll. At a time when Hannah Montana, High School Musical, and Camp Rock were popular, struggling record companies were betting all their chips on tapping into that sound. The artificial manufacturing of edginess just completely lost touch with rock's down and dirty blues roots. It's the same reason R-rated action movie franchises had to be PG-13 rated. This is the reason rock and roll went back into the underground, this time a digital underground with MySpace and YouTube emerging as new platforms, and there it stayed to this day. So what was something you actually liked in the 2000s? Well... Besides Bruce Springsteen... Damn it. Oh, of course! Audio Slave. Ah, oh, shirtless Chris Cornell. Does it for me every time. Does it for me every time, too. Yeah. Same with me. You've got Chris Cornell following Soundgarden's disbandment, fronting the rhythm section of Rage Against the Machine, who had parted with Zach De La Racha. Anything Tom Morello related is cool with me. While I don't quite get into these songs the same way as I do Soundgarden or Rage, I still think all three of their albums are very consistent. Though I have to admit, as much as I love Chris Cornell, hearing him saying killing in the name of it live aid, it doesn't really do much for me. Some of those that were forces while we're on the subject of Live 8 2005, Pink Floyd reunited with Roger Waters. For a Pink Floyd fanatic like myself, this was like witnessing the moon landing. This would be the last time the classic Pink Floyd lineup would play together as keyboardist Rick Wright passed in 2008. I'll tell you a band that didn't perform their last show, The Rolling Stones. It's rough, just as old, yeah. yeah, now in their fifth decade together as a band, they put out another album in 2005 called A Bigger Bang, and it was actually kind of cool. Seriously, how old are they at this point? Big decade for the Stones. They had this album, and they were on The Simpsons. Sorry, Mick! Simpsons! 
man! In fact, there were quite a few big reunions in this decade. Cream reunited for a couple shows in 2005, which would be their last time on stage together. Two years later, Led Zeppelin reunited for a concert with Jason Bonham on drums. Also, despite the tragic death of lead singer Lane Staley, Alice in Chains reunited with William Duvall, not to be confused with Robert Duvall. Another supergroup that formed in the 2000s was Velvet Revolver, which was basically Guns N' Roses minus Axel and Izzy with former STP singer Scott Weiland. That didn't last too long, though, mostly due to Wyland's drug addiction. I guess they really did fall to pieces. You wouldn't be the first person to make that pun. And if you're wondering what Axl Rose was doing right about now, he put out an album under the Guns N' Roses name, Chinese Democracy. And since he's the only member of the album, and it took like a decade to finally come out, most GNR fans hate it. And of course, there was a certain album from a classic 90s band that I consider one of the best of the decade, but first, I want to set the scene. By 2003, the unification of America following 9-11 had pretty much disintegrated once George W. Bush declared war on Iraq. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. I won't get into a whole political discussion about it. Suffice to say, even at my own school, protests were gathering and parents and teachers were scolding us for doing so. I felt compelled myself to start writing my own protest songs. Big man. So you can imagine how disappointed I was by the lack of protest music coming out at the time. I do feel vindicated that Lindsay Ellis explored this subject recently. The fact that instead of protest songs against the Vietnam War in the 60s and 70s, Fortunate Son, Machine Gun, What's Going On, the political songs of the 2000s seem to be pro-war. Yeah, there's a reason Team America did a parody of songs like this. Well, the Dixie Chicks spoke out against the war and it kind of affected their career. And, and, System of a Down had that song, Bring Your Own Bombs. I mean, Neil Young did an album called Living With War in 2006. Subtle. But really, there weren't many bands leading the charge here. So you can imagine my surprise when one day my drummer played a new CD from Green Day called American Idiot. Don't wanna be an American idiot! Welcome to our new kind of tension Across the alien mission Everything is in that be and we were like, Green Day made this? The same guys who made Dookie have made a political rock opera about a suburbanite teenager coming of age in the post 9-11 climate. And musically, it definitely had its roots in that 60s, 70s style, owing a lot to the Who's Tommy, or especially a quick one while he's away. In a sea of generic, forgettable rock albums, this is the one that easily stood out. It's like you're watching a really amazing scene in an otherwise bad movie. That's American Idiot in the 2000s. To this day, it really feels like not just a time capsule over the anger we felt during this period, but it still feels relevant today. This song is not anti-American, it's anti The biggest tune to come from this album was Wake Me Up When September Ends. Wake me up when September ends. Billy Joe manages to embody all the millennials' feelings of hopelessness and apathy while still being a memorable pop rock tune. The biggest problem with American Idiot is that it was a reminder that there just wasn't anything else like it in the mainstream. Well, technically, My Chemical Romance put out a rock opera of their own. Oh. The Black Parade. In fact, it was produced by Rob Cavallo, who also worked on American Idiot. It was more in line with Pink Floyd's The Wall, dealing with the subject of a patient passing into the afterlife. I mean, I definitely like the theatrics and energy, but in terms of capturing the mood of a wounded country, there's still not much to comment on outside of these two albums. 
John Mayer's musical equivalent to throwing in the towel felt very much the late 2000s anthem. John Mayer had so many great albums. My favorite was the one with Stop This Train. I remember sitting in the car, driving along, and just listening to it over and over again. I mean, you were into blues, right? So you had to be into the John Mayer trio. I mean, he was definitely a good guitar player. I never really understood why there seemed to be this disconnect between the cool blues band he formed with Steve Jordan. and the mainstream singer-songwriter vibe he was known for. But again, that's just the direction that the industry was heading. It's like the guitar solo was too retro to be in contemporary records. Seriously, I heard that a lot. If you don't play a guitar solo in one of these songs, that dates it to this period. That cements it to a trend that's happening in music right now. Yeah, never mind that Guitar Hero was one of the biggest selling games at the time. I mean, seriously, what is with these corporate suits? The same year I saw Green Day perform American Idiot at the Grammys. I'm not kidding, I was actually there. Gwen Stefani performed that weird reinvention of that Fiddler on the Roof song. Oh, God, no, not, not, not this song, no. No, don't show, you're showing it. And I was like, what the hell am I watching? Remember how much we love No Doubt? Sure, but by the mid-2000s, No Doubt was pretty much done. Remember that song, Hey Bi- hmm? What? Hey, what happened to your rocker outfit? Oh, that, yeah, I stopped listening to the radio around 2005. Maybe it was because of my own musical tastes changing at the time, or MTV just diving deeper and deeper into shit, but I just couldn't stand the sound of the music that was coming out at that time. Look, I hate to break your rock and roll hearts, but this just wasn't the era of rock music. It was the era of Beyonce. And you said it earlier, it was the era of hip hop. Wow, it's true. All little John ever said was, yeah, yeah, or what, or okay. And they did still work together from time to time. Remember when Jay-Z collabed with Linkin Park? Now what the hell are you wearing? And you know, sometimes rappers sampled rock songs to good effect, like Eminem using Aerosmith's Dream On. It's no control, he just lets his emotions go. Come on! Sing! Sing it! We'll take a sample, let's say a Led Zeppelin song, then add in a drum machine. And we'll have MC Other Guy drop a verse over it. Magical beat! Let's agree to never do that again. I make no promises. Well, even in the 2000s, hip-hop felt like it was going kind of through the same identity crisis that rock went through in the 80s. And I never liked it relying on autotune, which really took the angst out of both hip-hop and rock and roll. Autotune started off interesting, being used as a new effect by groups like Daft Punk. But it got real old real fast. That's because autotune really wipes away natural inflections of someone's real voice. And it makes everyone sound the same. And since production techniques were being monopolized, this essentially made every song blend together. Whether it was hip hop or R&B or pop or even rock and roll. So we're at the back half of the 2000s and honestly there's really not much to talk about unless you're a fan of... James Blunt? You're beautiful! Oh, I hate uh, that song, no! Why? Mm -mm. Why? Though I will admit the classic rockers did give us some gems. I remember really enjoying the video for the Chili Peppers' Danny California, and yes, I'm aware it sounds a lot like Tom Petty's Dance with Mary Jane. The video actually goes through the history of rock, from a 50s Elvis thing, to the British Invasion, psychedelia, glam rock, hair metal, grunge, and finally to the modern era. Hey. 
In fact, I think this video might have been one of my earliest inspirations for making this show. The Foo Fighters had one of their biggest hits with 2007's The Pretender, and this is just a great angsty rock and roll song. As for modern bands of the time, I mean, I remember a lot of people getting into Kings of Leon. I mean, I didn't. I'd probably lob them in the same group as Nickelback, to be honest. I actually really dig the band Whole Wheat Bread, who are criminally underrated. Coldplay had that song Viva La Vida, probably one of their best. It was kind of like a modern day Eleanor Rigby. Anything else? I, I, I don't know. Uh, Slipknot? All right, I think that's enough. So let's get back to our final question. Oh no, the dirts. They stole it from us. They stole my precious Paramour CD. Oh yeah, I totally forgot. I swiped this from my Sublease's uh, closet. I love this album. Subli- Wait a minute. No, no, don't turn on the cameras! Ah! 300 Jennifer Peel Monster! Run! Run! Ah! Where have you been this whole time? I have come from the misty mountains of... Oh, screw this. Have you guys talked about Paramore yet? You can't talk about Paramore without talking about the incomparable vocals of Haley Williams. At the age of 14, she was scrouting, she was belting, and melting faces. I think I was 13 or something, not even knowing they had written music, and I just wrote a poem and I brought it to practice one day and started singing it to the music. And she already had a contract with Atlantic Records. And while they planned to make her into yet another pop princess, she totally convinced the label to let her and the band create rock music even if Decode was used in the Twilight movies. But in 2007, their album Riot was really their breakthrough, with hits like That's What You Get and of course my favorite, Misery Business. I agree with you 100%. Paramore is seriously one of my favorite bands. Anything off the Riot album is a classic. Someone else on this show with some actual good taste. Thank you. I'm still keeping the CD. Well, while we're in 2007, we might as well talk about Avril Lavigne's only number one song to top the Billboard charts. Yeah, well, we already went through Avril Lavigne. I'm talking about her again, Mr. I'm gonna talk about the Beatles every episode of the show, Ringo. Hey, she's got you there, pal. Wait, this was her only number one? I mean, Complicated wasn't a chart topper? Nope. In fact, Girlfriend was the first video to reach 100 million views on YouTube. That's cool. Hey, didn't uh, Pink's You and Your Hand come out in 2007? I believe it did. I'm not here for your There were so many female rock stars in 2007. I mean, think about it. You had the Veronica's, Within Temptation, Flyleaf. Right 2007 was a totally kick-ass year for female rockers. You know, speaking of Kurt Cobain, he once said women are the only future in rock and roll. And I kind of see what he means. Whereas so many of these emo singers sound like they're singing way out of their range, these women are just able to belt in a way that no one else could. And as we get into the 2010s, I do feel like my favorite rock acts have been female driven. I mean, there are still plenty of dude bands totally rocking hard that year. I mean, Avenged Sevenfold? Yeah, now we're talking! I'm not insane, I'm not, not insane. Or Bullet for My Valentine? Hey, that's another band that emerged from MySpace. 
Now is this emo? No, this is metalcore. Ah, uh, uh, give up. Come on, there has to be another rock and tune that could close us out for the 2000s. What about something in 2009? I don't know. 2009 was a very depressing year for me. I'd had enough of the LA music scene and was going to move to New York City to reach for my moment and try to make an honest stand. Listen, I hate to interrupt your like totally touching story, but what about Muse? Their album cover from Resistance is featured in the cover art of our show. Oh yeah, good point. Uprising by English band Muse. At a time when I was losing interest in watching videos on VH1 and cable in general, the song Uprising stood out to me. While it did incorporate the Radiohead-inspired electronic atmosphere, it was also anchored with that Queen-style stadium rock groove. The theme of the lyrics was very much rebellious and anti-capitalist, and the rest of their album, Resistance, was straight-up progressive and symphonic rock, complete with guitar solos, showing that the genre still had some life left in it. But you know what? There's one more cool rock and roll story to close out this decade. There was a campaign in the UK to dethrone Christmas songs produced by the X Factor claiming the number one slot at the end of every year. The campaign wanted to see Rage Against the Machine's Killing in the Name take the number one spot, which the band and many other rockers were totally on board for. And we are honored that they've chosen our song to be the rebel anthem to try to topple the uh, X Factor monopoly. And it did indeed generate enough interest to shoot the 1992 single to number one. Yeah, Killin' in the Name of by Rage Against the Machine beat out the corporate X Factor single to become the number one UK Christmas song in 2009. Now that is rock and roll! Yeah, man. Woo! So that brings us to our end question. Did the 2000s rock hard? No. Mm, meh. It's a no from me, dog. Credit to our followers for some good suggestions. I did find some nice surprises, but it's still just not my thing. Even objectively, it just doesn't feel like we've covered any new ground here. And the few times it did go somewhere new, especially electronically, it feels like it's strayed too far away from its blues roots and isn't rock and roll anymore. You know, I think I might actually hate this decade more than you do. At this point, the music industry just threw its hands up as if to say, we give up. I just grew to hate the sound of mainstream music in general. It's that over-reliance on technology and trends and not the musician's own skill and voice. I mean, I liked it back in the day. But did they really rock as hard as, say, Nirvana? No. Did they create the same kind of vibe as Hart or Fleetwood Mac? Not really. Were they as groundbreaking as the Beatles? <laughs> not by a long shot, let's face it. Um, I actually have a different perspective over here since I'm not an 80s baby like y'all. But I do agree with you guys. The face of music totally changed in the 2000s because of the internet. Rock and roll was already leaning towards pop since the 80s, but we really start to see those lines blur in the 2000s. Pop punk and pop rock are all over the top 40 music charts. We also start to see more female lead singers take the spotlight, yes queens, although not nearly enough. But it was a great time for indie rockers. Their music normally wouldn't get that kind of attention that a big corporation could provide, but now these indie artists have the accessibility to reach a larger, new audience. You know, if this was your generation's version of adolescent rock, there's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy your 2000s rock music. I'm gonna keep listening to the old classics and discover some independent releases as well. And so will I. Well, glad I could stop by. Oh, hey, wait, um... So I was cleaning up the place and I found about 50 kilos of blue crystal meth in the closet. Do you know anything about that? Oh no, my feet is breaking up. You know we can see you. I am the one who knocks. Hmm, that explains a lot. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. I'll see you all oh, next wait, wait, time. Wait, 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 hold on. What? There's something missing. Oh, wait, you didn't play the Tiny Tim clip. 
Oh yeah. I guess I didn't. Yo, thanks for watching this video. Who's your favorite 2000s artist? We'd like to know. Should we even bother? With 2010s, they're not much harder. Comment below, let us know. Now we gotta go. Hey everyone, just wanted to give a huge thank you to all our supporters who donated. We couldn't have done this episode without you. Thank you so much. And another thank you to our Patreon supporters and really a big thanks to my co-host right here. I love you both. No problem, man. Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you uh, when we decide to do another episode. Yeah. So uh, take care.